Everybody? How's it going? Is everybody really awake after lunch? So I came in from the West Coast. We don't have Dunkin' Donuts on the West Coast. Um, I'm really looking forward to drinking like a medium iced coffee from Dunkin' Donuts later. So uh, if anybody wants to go get one and wake up, let me know. Um, hey, what's up? My name's Pete. Uh, you might be wondering why a JavaScript person is speaking at a CSS conference, because I'm probably the least talented CSS person in the room. Um, but just a little bit about me. Uh, I worked at Facebook for a number of years, um, specifically worked on the Instagram team, uh, built out, you know, the first version of everything that you see on Instagram.com. This includes photo pages, profile pages, business tools. So we actually had this whole suite of like analytics and ad creation stuff and basically stuff that pays the bills um, we created. Grew that team up, um, ended up being an engineer manager over there. Um, probably uh, most excited about my work on React. So um, we wanted to build a really rich and immersive um, experience on Instagram.com, and we had some technical limitations that required us to render exclusively on the client. Um, you know, you're scaling, you don't want to burn too many CPU cycles rendering stuff on the server, so we wanted to render on the client. There was this kind of crazy, weird technology that put your HTML and your JavaScript in, inside of Facebook called React that we, we built the first single page app with React. We did the first data fetching with React. And it was kind of the first full on React app. And then later I worked on open sourcing it. And, um, and you know, s I've, since then I've backed off a little bit from the project, but I still, I'm a huge fan and work in the community a lot. Most recently I've been working on a startup called Smite. Um, we try to find you know, all the online harassers, the spammers, the, the trolls, all those bad guys um, on the internet, classify them, and then you know, take them out. So if you're a social app or a marketplace and you got these problems, let me know. Happy to help. So I wanted to start by um, kind of sharing my perspective. And I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, I talk a lot of crap about CSS because I really don't like it. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then you know, I realize that my perspective is not the right perspective, but it's also not necessarily the wrong perspective either. I just come from a background of developing applications. So if you think about what Facebook is like or what Instagram is like, it's not really a document, right? You've got these reusable components all over the place. It's interactive. You're fetching data. Stuff is updating all over the place. And the way that you build and style and construct an application is a lot different than how you would build and construct a document. The separation of, of content from style is um, less important in an application. It's very important in a document. Um, and there's all sorts of different kind of concerns here. So in this talk, I wanted to focus specifically on the concerns of app developers rather than more content-based um, documents. So I took a look back in, um, into the history of CSS. And CSS was kind of designed from the beginning to work with documents. Um, there's this great document uh, right there that you can take a look at that talks about how CSS came about. And it turns out in the 90s, there was a bunch of authors that were um, pretty upset that they couldn't change um, the color of text in a reliable way um, in their web pages. And so there were a bunch of competing style sheet proposals. And CSS is obviously the one that eventually won out. And um, it had one feature that distinguished it from all the others. It took into account that on the web, um, the style of a document couldn't be designed by either the author or the reader um, on their own, but their wishes had to be combined um, or cascaded in some way. So if you guys remember how browsers used to work, there was an author style sheet where you say, hey, this is how I want my page to look. And then the user creates their own style sheet and says, hey, I want the font size to be a little bit bigger because I have trouble reading it, or I want to reduce the size of the images, or I don't want to see these ads. Um, and you would combine those, the browser would combine those two style sheets, or multiple author style sheets, multiple user style sheets, and eventually compute the style. Does this make sense? Is this something that everybody's been doing every day since then? So three years ago, that feature got removed from the most popular browser on the desktop. And um, so effectively, kind of the entire reason that CSS won out was this cascading feature that was designed to support user style sheets. And we don't have user style sheets anymore. So throughout this talk, I'm going to kind of make the case that CSS has a couple of vestigial tails. And those, when you start to develop with components, those can get in the way a little bit. And so there are certain techniques that you can use to try to avoid those and some more crazy ideas uh, when it comes to styling applications and components that we could take a look at. 
Uh, but I've said the word component a couple times now. Um, I think everybody's got a different definition of component. Um, I come from the React world. Uh, I'm not trying to do a React talk. Um, so I'm just kind of looking at components in the context of a piece of UI that's reusable in different contexts. So rather than, you know, um, a, a header that can look different based on, on kind of where it is, a component you want to kind of behave the, the exact same no matter where it's placed. Now, somebody in this room actually pioneered the technique of developing components in CSS. Um, maybe somebody did it earlier, I couldn't find any evidence, but Nicole Sullivan created this idea of object-oriented CSS um, back in 2010. And um, she, the kind of example that she used to talk about components and reusable CSS is called the media object. And the way she describes it is, it's an, it's a, the media object is an image to the left with descriptive content to the right. She has this whole blog post about it. Um, I suggest you check it out if you haven't already. It's kind of cool. So this is an example of a media object on Facebook. You can see my profile photo to the left and a bunch of descriptive stuff to the right. Um, it's not just a Facebook thing, though. Um, you can see it on Twitter, too. Um, you can see it not just in terms of comments and tweets, but you can also see kind of recommended people to follow or also media objects. Um, I saw it in Gmail. Um, I saw it in LinkedIn as well. It's all over the place. So the way that you construct a media object in HTML and object-oriented CSS, um, according to, to Nicole on her blog, looks something like this. So you have this top-level div that has a class of media. Um, it's got a link inside there. And then it, the image um, is, is embedded inside the link. And then there's a, a separate kind of content area. And you can tell that this, was, this article was written in, in 2010 because we've got some browser hacks in there to make everything work in like IE6. Um, but you get the idea. So the, the whole point of developing code in this way is you create this one style sheet and you never create any more CSS when you want to render something like this. You simply cu cut and paste this markup and the CSS is generic enough to, to render this style of component all over the place. There's a lot of benefits. It's less code to maintain, less code to send down um, to the browser. Um, and there's just a lot of, of great benefits to, to building components in this way. So if you're an Ashley Simpson fan, it renders like this. Um, by the way, I have these JS Fiddle links that you'll probably not be able to copy down, but I'll put the slides up or something. Uh, but you, know, you, you can believe that it renders something like that. So let's build this media object, this kind of canonical reusable component in React. Now again, I'm not trying to, to teach you React in this talk. Um, if you're using web components or some other system, even templates that use partials, um, all the, the same ideas should apply. Um, so the key idea here, number one, is that there's no static HTML. All of your HTML is generated, is generated procedurally from JavaScript. So it, you're not copy and pasting component code, you're, you're referencing a component and then the engine is rendering it for you. And the second piece is that you build components out of other components, and this is how you can build complicated apps. You've got a high-level application component that represents your whole app, a profile component that represents one page in your single page app, et cetera, et cetera, until you go down to a primitive component which just renders a div or just renders a link or something like that. So if we were to, to build this in React, um, it would look like this. Uh, I'm just gonna breeze through this because I'm just using React to, to illustrate this. Um, but we have a component called media object. Um, every React component has a render method that returns the description of the markup that it should render. Um, there's some weird syntax in here called JSX, which basically is a way to embed HTML in your JavaScript. I'm not gonna fight that battle today, sorry. Uh, but uh, there's just a couple weird things about it. Instead of class, there's class name. Um, those little curly braces let you interpolate values into your markup, and this.props references the properties that are passed to a component. So a component can be reused. You pass it these props, which are key value um, pairs, and then it renders some piece of DOM. Is, does this make sense? Is this, I'm seeing sufficient nods that I'm gonna move on. Okay, cool, and thumbs up, nice. So if I wanted to use this component, you would kind of call it as if it was its own tag or custom tag. So you see here I have a, a div, which is a regular old HTML element, but then I have this media object, which then passes link and image props, uh, as well as children to that component. And so I've rendered two of them uh, in this application, and then if I were to render this to the browser, it would look like this. 
And uh, you can see we just can kind of reference this media object component over and over again and render as many of these as we want in any context. It should render the same. Whether we want to render an ad unit, recommend somebody, follow somebody on Twitter, or a comment, we should be able to reuse this piece of code. Um, so everything's good, right? We can just reuse this all over the place. Is there any problems that are going to arise? Anyone think of anything? Someone just said Cascade. I wonder if they're pandering to me or not. <laughs> well, the, yeah, I do hate the Cascade. Um, but the first one is, is definitely related to the Cascade. It's class name conflicts. So CSS is this big global namespace. And all of these different components could be coming from different authors. Maybe you pull in one from a third party vendor. You have two different teams inside your organization that are building components they don't know about each other. And then you have a third product team that glues them together. And none of these different um, authors really know about each other. And it can get even worse, where the, the person that glues the components together then leaves, somebody comes back, upgrades the dependencies, and now there's this whole other set of crap you have to deal with. Um, and a lot of this stuff comes from class name conflicts. And we actually saw this a lot on Instagram, sadly. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a second. So let's say that we wanted to build this see more component. Uh, what this is, is this is a piece of text with like a little arrow at the end that says, um, that kind of indicates to the user that they're going to go off site. Um, you've seen this on like Wikipedia and some other places. Um, again, you know, we, we have this top level class name of, of see more applied to the div. Um, we render whatever children are passed in um, to the tag, and we render a little image at the end. And we have some, some crappy styling that is, is not according to best practices, but whatever. Um, it's like someone could reasonably write this. Now, if we render this um, in our application, again, we just reference this custom component um, as any other tag. Um, it renders like this. You know, you got some text, you got a little icon at the end. Now, let's say we want to combine this and our media object. So we want to have one of these kind of external see more links inside of our media object. So the natural way to do that is to take our media object, which we built with best practices and modular object-oriented CSS, and compose it um, together with this see more component. So we built the media object just like we normally do, except instead of passing text to it, we pass a see more component. Now, we're composing components together. This should just work, right? If you actually put this in the browser, um, you get this. And this is not what we wanted. We wanted this arrow to be on the right-hand side of the text, not the left-hand side of the text. And the reason for that is if you look at the CSS that we used um, for both the media object at the top and the see more component in the bottom, we have a conflict between this dot image class name which is a pretty generic sounding class name. Um, now you might think that this is like somewhat of a contrived example, but this is actually exactly what happened to us on Instagram. We had a class name called image that was used in two slightly different ways. And what we had done is we had taken um, what used to be kind of separate, uh, web or se separate server rendered pages with CSS and we turned them into a single page application. So what, what would happen is in the kind of traditionally rendered version, um, we had kind of tested and, and we didn't know about the specificity war between the two different image uh, rules and everything worked fine. But once we started dynamically loading in components in our single page application and pulling down the CSS on demand as we needed it, we couldn't guarantee which order those rules would, would load in as. So we had this phenomenon where we would go on the profile page and everything would look fine. Then we would switch to the feed and everything would look fine. And then the person would hit the back button and go back to the profile page and suddenly images that were supposed to have rounded corners didn't, or vice versa. Um, it was actually really bad, like one corner was rounded and the other one wasn't. It was just like, it, it was embarrassing. Um, and when you've kind of built without thinking about components, refactoring your way out of this is really, really hard. Uh, especially when you have like preprocessors in play that are generating like lots of code. Um, it's hard to keep track of all this stuff. So there's a, a bunch of methodologies that do help you out with this. Um, one of them is called BEM. Um, but just very simply, the, the way to solve this is rather than use the descendant selector for namespacing, you prefix every class name with kind of the name of the component or some sort of unique ID that prevents those conflicts between multiple components. So you notice here we don't have any class called image anymore. We have a media image and we have a seam more image. And when we make these changes, um, everything renders the way that you would expect. So the, the overriding theme here is 
we took an unpredictable style sheet and it's now become much more predictable. So one of my rules of thumb when developing style sheets with components is to really stick with single class name selectors only and to never use descendant selectors um, or really any sort of clever selectors that can in interact like that. A second rule is your class name should be unambiguously namespaced. Now I mentioned you, know, you can just prefix the name of the component or you can use a methodology like BEM. Um, there's also this cool technology um, called CSS modules. It's not tied to Webpack, but there's a great implementation with Webpack. Um, it will take care of namespacing your CSS for you so you don't really have to think about it as much. Now, it generally needs, means you need to swallow kind of a bunch of, of build tools um, in order to, to, to work with it. Um, but it is really cool technology if you're set up in that way. Um, and the third uh, rule that I have is that class names should be referenced exactly once in your JS code, and they should be private to the component that, that uses them. So this is important here. Um, a lot of times people use CSS classes in order to reuse styles throughout their page. You've, if you have this common you know, set of, of style properties that you want to apply to a DOM node, you create a class for it, and then you start applying that class to all these different DOM nodes. Um, my argument is that if you have a powerful component system on the client, the component system is designed to reuse different pieces of UI for you. So you don't have to actually use the um, style reuse capability of CSS, especially because it, ca it does have some unpredictable properties. So instead, you just reference your CSS class once, and every time you want to reuse that, you know, use a new React component or a new web component or a new um, template or partial template. Um, and that applies even to tiny little bits of UI um, like this. So rather than have you know, a, a CSS class called special link, just create a really lightweight component called special link and, um, and off you go. So if you take a look at how we've kind of ended up once we start following all those rules, we have our namespaced um, CSS class names in our, in our JS and our, our CSS. We're only referring to every um, CSS class once. So nowhere in here will you find two references to media under under image. And if you start kind of developing in the style for a while, you'll realize that you'll have your JS file open in your left pane of your editor, your CSS file open in your right pane, and you'll just bounce back and forth between those two files a lot. And you'll start to, to kind of have this like disconnect between the two files. Like you, you see the DOM node that you want to style, and then you got to go look in the CSS, kind of find the rules that all apply to it, and then edit those rules, reload the browser, and it, it does kind of slow you down. And since you're only referring to a class name in one place in your code, um, it's functionally equivalent to doing all of your styles in line. Because again, if we're developing in components and you're trying to de-emphasize the cascade, de-emphasize um, you know, a lot of the, the issues where, where specificity matters. Um, inline styles isn't actually that bad. Um, so if we were to write that component in all inline styles, um, again, in React, it would look a little bit ugly. Um, so we have these kind of two curly braces. The first curly brace represents, hey, I'm going to interpolate a JavaScript expression into this DOM node. And then the second one is a new JavaScript key value object. So we're, we're basically passing, you know, um, little bits of inline style uh, into these, these components. Now, if you were writing regular HTML, those would be style strings, but in React, you gotta be a little weird. Um, so the disadvantage here is like it is a little bit ugly. The advantage is I can look at this and I can immediately say, see just from looking at the component definition how it's going to render. And so I started um, kind of developing in this style a little bit and then started kind of moving some stuff around and, and writing a couple of lightweight abstractions and refactored this to look like this. So a, a lot of times when you render a div, you really just want to render some sort of block element. Um, with Flexbox, you know, you, you could have a flex row, flex column. And this, I think, is, is super easy to read. I'm like, oh, okay, I, um, my element renders this block. It's got um, 10 pixels around it. I'm going to float a block to the left and put a margin right of 10. Um, it just kind of, you don't have to bounce between that top JS and the, the bottom CSS file, and you don't have to parse all these extra curly braces and expressions. Um, so we've been developing um, our front ends in this way for almost two years now at Smite, 
Uh, it's open source. Um, it's available at github.com slash smite slash JSX style. Um, I think that you know some people in the community have have really thought that it's it's inter an interesting way to develop, and some people are building applications with it. Um, you know, I encourage you to check it out, keep an open mind, and see how you like it. Um, inline styles are not perfect, though. There, I'm sure there's a million things that you guys can think of that suck about inline styles. Um, I don't think that specificity is one of them because I just don't think we should be thinking about specificity at all ever, because um, we should get rid of the cascade. But media queries. This is a great example. Um, you want to conditionally change how some element renders based on the width of the viewport, for example. There's no easy way to do that with inline styles. Um, my suggestion is just write style sheets the way that you normally have. That seems like a great use of style sheets and what they're designed for. You know, that's kind of like um, a little bit more true to how documents work, right? They're, they're um, elastic. Uh, as far as kind of simpler, um, you know, like features of CSS, like pseudo classes. Um, one thing that we're playing around with is um, adding extra magic style attribu attributes to those, those components. So rather than saying like block color equals something, you can say block color equals something, hover color equals something else. And that will code gen you know, the, the proper CSS rule to change the color um, when the users hover their mouse over it. You might also be thinking about accessibility, separation of you know, style from content, and that type of thing. Um, you know, first of all, I, I think that this is a great way to build apps. I don't claim to know the best way to develop more content-heavy sites or, or publications. Um, I'll leave that to the experts. But in terms of accessibility and applications, just because you're developing with inline styles doesn't mean that you have to use divs everywhere. Um, in JSX style, anyway, there's this component prop you can say, you can pass to a component and say, hey, I want to render a, a block, but I actually want the component to be article. Um, you can also um, pass around all the ARIA attributes um, to improve kind of accessibility. And um, you know, another thing, too, is, is keep in mind that just because you're developing with kind of like semantic tags and separate content from, um, from style doesn't mean that you automatically get accessibility for free. Like, you always have to go through in voiceover, and you always have to go through and try and navigate through your site with just the keyboard to make sure that it works. Um, so you know this approach of kind of styling everything as quickly as we can in, in a more application kind of development style, and then going through and adding the accessibility stuff and the and the the kind of hints to the the browser later, has worked really well for us. The big one for me though, and what kept me off of inline styles for a long time was performance. So we um, actually originally shipped our product to customers just naively inserting inline styles into the DOM. Now, uh, our application, it's targeted towards like desktop users with powerful computers, and we render like lots of visualizations and long lists and just like shoving like a lot of data into the browser. And we found that rendering inline styles was just too slow. Like we were creating these giant strings and we were inserting them into the DOM, and it was, um, you know, it was locking up the user experience just to like create that string and garbage collect that string. Uh, so what we ended up doing was making a change to JSX style where you write your code in a style where you, it looks like you're writing inline styles, but under the hood, we code gen a, a style sheet and we insert that style sheet into the DOM. So the code that you write looks like block margin equals five and then some content. And then we insert um, into the head a style tag and we auto gen a class name and we give it a margin of five and actually a display of block too, which I didn't include there. And then um, all we do is apply this, this class name to, the, to the, the actual DOM node itself. And what's cool about this is you can actually reuse these class names between similar looking components. So if you tend to just have some divs that have five pixels of margin around them, all of them will get the same class name. Or if you render a long list of items, you'll create this style sheet once and then just reference it throughout the rest of your, uh, the life cycle of your application. Uh, in terms of, of kind of more performance, uh, the, the problem with that technique is it makes server rendering substantially more difficult. So if you want to render out a static web page to serve to Google or to serve to a mobile device, um, you're going to want it styled without having a bunch of inline styles in it because caching is going to be not super fun. Um, so there's an experimental uh, tool chain that we've built that will walk through all of your components and see where you're referencing constants. So a good example is if you created one of those block components and you said margin equals five or margin equals some global constant, we know that that's always going to be five. 
And so we can co-gen that CSS file ahead of time and um, kind of just reference it from the web page itself. Some things you can't do that for. So if we say, um, you know, block color equals some variable or some expression that is not known until runtime, that we can't generate ahead of time. So what we found is that for, you know, around 80% of your CSS properties, you can generate CSS that's equivalent to what you would have written um, by hand if you follow the other kind of modular CSS principles that I lined up. Um, but, you know, in the case that we can't do that, uh, you can always fall back to, to handwritten CSS. There's no reason why you, why you can't use any handwritten CSS. In my opinion, you try to write as much inline as you can just because it's like a really nice developer experience, but if you really need to fall back to, to regular CSS, that's totally cool. Um, now, the, the kind of crazy idea that we're trying out over the last couple weeks, and I'm not sure if this is a good idea or not, I'd love for people who know CSS better than I do to, to educate me on this. Um, but what I found is that inheritance in CSS um, has some problems when you're trying to reuse components. So let's go back to that example of this media object. And when I mouse over this thumbnail, I want some tooltip to appear um, you know, in, the, in the browser. Now, there's a lot of different ways to, to implement tooltips. One common way is you surround this element with a, a position relative container, and then you position the, um, the tooltip uh, you know, as a child, or you put that, the tooltip as a child of that element and position absolute it into the right spot. So while it doesn't look like it's a child element of that, that container, it actually is. So let's say that we, we've implemented this, some other teams you know, pulled a tooltip component off the shelf, you know, combined it with this media object, and we render it in our app um, like this. So we've, we've added the tooltip object to the media object component. And let's say in our application we want to render the kind of caption to the right of that media object um, in small caps. So if we add that, that uh, CSS rule here at the bottom, we just say dot app, which is you know, our class name right there, font variant, small caps. We get the desired result without the tooltip, but if you didn't actually mouse over um, every one of these in your production application um, or in, in your staging environment, you might not have realized that you also styled the text of the tooltip. And if your tooltip was supposed to be using you know, small caps in another way or um, any one of these inherited CSS properties, um, you've actually kind of accidentally styled the tooltip when you didn't mean to style the tooltip. So there's um, a couple ways to, to deal with this. Um, the first one is you, like the tooltip maybe should explicitly provide all of those um, kind of base styles that it expects. Um, but I don't think it's reasonable to expect all component authors to do that. So the crazy idea is what if we applied a CSS reset to every component um, in your hierarchy to opt out of this inheritance? Which, you know, it kind of makes sense, right? We, we apply a CSS reset to our entire page and if you think of your whole page as a component and each of subcomponent as like a mini application in and of itself, it kind of conceptually makes sense to kind of reset to a blank slate environment. But what gets a little bit weird is a lot of times you do want to actually set the font face for you know, all children of some subtree of your components or you do want to set the color or the mouse pointer. So my proposal is rather than just get rid of inheritance entirely, we want to make it opt in rather than opt out. So if you want to style a, if you want to change the font face of something, you can either say, hey, I just want to change the font face of this component, or um, I want to change the font face of this component and all of its children. Um, so I think that's a pretty interesting idea. We're in the early days of implementing it on a, on a pull request. Um, again, I've never used this particular technique in a production app, so I don't know if it's good or not, but I just think it's an interesting thing to think about. Because if you look at any other UI construction toolkit on any other platform, nobody has anything like this. Um, so I think it's one of these holdovers from the days when CSS was meant only for documents. And again, you know, there's a couple of performance things that I think will make this difficult to push to production in all use cases, but I just think it's an interesting experiment. So at the end of the day, um, you know, I think that CSS was great for documents and for people that are developing more content heavy sites, um, I think CSS is, uh, is great. Um, I'm not an expert in that though, so maybe someone disagrees with me. Um, but I don't think it's particularly well suited to the needs of 2016 apps. I think if you were gonna sit down this year and be like, I'm gonna build a way to style apps, you would not come up with CSS. Um, 
I think that rather than reusing chunks of CSS and, and CSS classes, you should reuse components. Um, inline styles, I think, are really fun to develop in. They've historically had a lot of problems, um, but I think those problems can be mitigated, and we have an app in production that does mitigate those problems. So it's been pretty good for us. And I think there's some really interesting future work around inheritance that we could explore. That's all I have. Thank you, guys. I wish we could uh, cue Prince controversy here as a little like lead segue into your inside the actor studio chat. Uh -oh. I went over this way. Uh, we've got a bunch of questions uh, for you. How do you feel after your controversial talk to a bunch of CSS people? Everyone seems really nice. Everyone seems nice. <laughs> You're still on stage, so. <laughs> um, all right, so we've got a few talks from folks. Let's, um, let's go here. So one thing was, oh, sorry, since I just lost that. Do, do, do. How can you leverage feature detection and still adhere to component-based styling? Um, we generally would I know this is bad, but Facebook does a lot of user agent sniffing. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't know, developing in, in desktop apps with Flexbox, I haven't had to do that much feature detection, because um, I'm only targeting every green, every green browsers at this point. Um, so again, this is a, a little more experimental. Um, but yeah, if you really need to use um, like Modernizer or one of these things, you can use your, your regular CSS techniques. Um, you just don't need to use um, style sheets for all of your layout. You know what I mean? Like a lot of times I'm just trying to line up like two or three boxes and I just don't want to bounce between style sheet and my, my JS code. Okay. Um, to follow that up, what happens if your JavaScript breaks and your markup isn't semantic and you're on a slow network connection or someone's trying to use your app from a place where uh, 3G or 2G is the norm? Well, there's, there's a couple things there. Uh, first of all, just because you're using this technique doesn't mean your markup's not going to be semantic. Um, if you think about CSS and the browser as a render target, and you have whatever abstraction you can dream of that eventually renders down to the same result, um, I, I think it, it, you don't have to accept that you're not going to have semantic markup. Um, you can generate you know, just as you can generate with, with the right tags and with the right um, the same kind of hierarchy that you otherwise would have. In terms of like what happens if the JavaScript breaks, uh, this is a little more of a um, of a JS framework question. React, in particular, supports server side rendering, where you can render out a page, um, you know, from the server, push it down, and then you know when the JavaScript on the client kicks in, it will like take over that markup and, and attach event listeners and stuff like that. So, I don't know. Uh, they're they're like it does work on the server. Um, and I think that's the only answer that really. So take care to make sure that you can actually render it on the server in case that that happens. So like, how does Facebook deal with it? Because I know they're, you know, internet for all and mm. accessible all over the world. Is that the? So I, I don't happening? work at Facebook anymore. I don't speak for Facebook. Oh. Just so everyone knows. Um, fa Facebook uh, renders the um, interactive parts, the parts that need interaction with JavaScript, and and still does a lot of server side rendering. Um, you know, and they're exploring a bunch of different ways to to change how that server-side rendering is done. But when I was there, it was still largely PHP. Uh, how does something like React fit in with web components? And what are your thoughts on web components where like CSS is a part of it? Yeah. Um, hmm. I don't really like web components. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you like web components? Uh, this is, I think, so I think the style encapsulation is cool. Um, I think the what we've been promised from the sh the kind of shadow DOM spec of like being able to customize a select box, awesome. Really excited about that. Five years later, we still don't have that. Um, I don't think the way that components communicate in web components is is particularly good. Um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's about it. Um, so my last question. Uh, how do you see like the these sort of philosophies of React making their way into other frameworks or other um, basically like not being totally married to the React system? Do you see that happening, like flowing into let's say other JS frameworks or other ways that we think about the web? Uh, 
but is it possible to do that in a way where we don't kind of give up the core philosophy of Tim Berners-Lee web for all, like the, the beauty of sort of CSS and HTML is like, boom, I've done it. Uh, and I think you do a good job in talking about the distinction between like, hey, I'm making an app with like this use case. This is a totally different use case than your document. Mm. Um, but do you see any of that uh, design philosophy percolating in? Well, there's a lot to, to dive in there, uh, or dive into there. The, the, the first thing is, is like, I, I kind of trash on, on the, you know, trying to shoehorn this like document, this model that was developed for documents into developing apps because like I've seen what the consumer like startup world is doing and the consumer tech world is doing and they're just like, web can't deliver the experiences that we want so we're just gonna ship on proprietary platforms and now people have to download a binary before they can use the app and it's gotta be signed by Apple and then you gotta like talk to them before pushing an update and that's, that sucks and it's less democratic and it's a lot harder for some kid to just like open up Web Inspector and start writing code. Um, so I think that that movement's pretty bad and I think that we need to, to kind of look critically at our abstractions and say, hey, you know, it's 2016, the fundamental building block of like every social app is this component called UI table view on iOS. Where it's, this, it's like the Instagram main feed, you know, where there's like these photos that scroll and there's sticky headers. You can't build that on the web. And it's like, it's been the most important component for a long time on, on native apps. So, you know, I, I think that if we can figure out a way to, to kind of give framework developers the, the abstractions that they need to build um, kind of performant applications, that's, that's really great. So there's um, the extensible web manifesto, which was popular a couple years ago, um, seemed to be going in the right direction. Like I think if we could just give everybody um, WebGL and shared memory pa parallelism uh, and maybe like a text rendering engine, uh, we'd be, we'd open the door for a lot of cool stuff. Um, I'm not, I think I went off on a tangent. I don't know if I actually answered your question. <laughs> no, it works, it works. Um, I think our other speaker is going to want to speak anyway, so that'll be a nice way to end. Okay, cool. Thanks so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys.